Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we look to resume our study in connection with Zephaniah, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance, his direction, and his understanding, so that we might more clearly understand that which we are being prepared to present to this world? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you on this Sabbath day. We thank you for this Sabbath rest. We thank you for the time that we may spend opening your word, taking in the words of your prophets <clears throat> so that we may more clearly understand the time in which we are living the guidance that you have given, and all that this means for us today. We ask, Father, that your spirit attend us, that your angels surround us. Help us that our minds might be open so that we may understand these things more clearly. That your instruction will not fall upon deaf ears that your grain will not fall upon hard soil. Help us now, guide us, so that we may become worthy of your character, worthy of your robe, worthy of the inclusion in the wedding feast of your son. For this we ask, for this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, in our situation and in our study right now, we are going through different portions of letters and documents that Mrs. White had written and seeing how these are interrelated with the book of Zephaniah. Now, we're going to recap a little bit <clears throat> from what we looked at last week. And we are going to go into several portions of this letter with the scripture that Mrs. White chose to reference. Light has been given me that as we near the close of this earth's history, we shall have the scenes of the San Francisco calamity repeated in other places. And I do want to gather strength that I may be able to stand before the people and bear a clear, decided testimony. The period of time in which we are living is a very solemn one. We had quite a shaking up in our houses here at home. What does it mean to us if our houses are being shaken? How can we symbolically apply this? Well, this would be uh, the straight testimony, the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans that causes a shaking. Okay. But if our houses are shaken, is this also not symbolically our faith being shaken? To see if we're going to hold firm to the faith once delivered to the saints? I would think so. Okay. Chimneys were thrown down, but no great damage was done. The printing plant at Mountain View suffered considerably. So what printing plant is she referring to here? Well, is this in Mountain View, California? Um, so this would be, I don't, I don't know what the printing press was called. Well, would this not be part of the Review and Herald at that time? I don't know. Okay. The printing plant at Mountain View suffered considerably. The side and the back walls of the factory were shaken down. The front remained standing. Now, if the front of something remained standing, 
What is another term that can be used? Here you have a great building, a printing plant. The side walls, of which there must be at least two, and the back walls. So the facade is remaining? The facade is remaining, yes. The facade is the face that is presented to the world. It's like the state of the guitar store right now. It's all torn apart inside. Everything has been stripped out. But on the outside, it still looks the same. Okay. It's a bit disconcerting, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so here we have the front, the facade of the printing press that remains. The new post office building just finished is a complete wreck, and some large store buildings were also in ruins. Several other buildings in Mountain View were twisted and broken pieces, more or less. In San Jose, many of the buildings were ruined and many chimneys were thrown down. These things make me feel very solemn because I know that the judgment day is right upon us. The judgments that have already come are a warning, but not the finishing of the punishment that will come on the wicked cities. Our cities are most terrible places wherein are practiced all kinds of sin and iniquity of the most revolting character. The Lord's name is greatly dishonored. When we reached San Francisco on our way home, we took a carriage and rode through the streets of the city for an hour and a half. We went up to Van Ness Avenue and onto our church building. The meeting house is still standing. It has sustained some damage, but can soon be repaired. It would have been a hard matter to arouse courage sufficient to rebuild if it had been destroyed. Beautiful Jefferson Park, close by the church property, is filled with tents and with people. San Francisco in ruins is the most complete, thorough, awful calamity I have ever looked upon. In the night season, I've had many presentations of the judgments of God coming upon our cities, and now I can understand the real meaning of these scenes that I have witnessed. Now, let us recall, this is letter 154, written in 1906. Written roughly a year after the Nashville warnings. She is only now beginning to understand the real meaning of the scenes that she had witnessed. <clears throat> In the book of Micah, we read the following. Now, I will read the first three verses. I'll need someone to read the ones, the three that follow, and then we'll go into Micah 2 and then take a look at this. Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, that, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down, and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured out are poured down a steep place. Someone could read the next three verses, please. For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore, 
for I will make Samaria as an heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard. And I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley and I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten into pieces and all the hires thereof shall be burned with fire and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. For she gathered it of the hire of an harlot and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Woe to them that devise iniquity and that work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Okay. Now, is the hire of an harlot to be brought to the temple of God? No. Is this to be used as an offering? No. Is it to be used for tithe? No. So this is accursed. Yes. Here we have an issue. We have a warning that is being given by the prophet Micah. We are being shown that this is what is going to occur at the end of time. Mrs. White is being very clear about this. She is being very direct about this. How many symbols, what other symbols can we see here? We have the situation with Micah 1, verse 5. For the transgression of Jacob is all this. And for the sins of the house of Israel, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What symbol do we apply to Samaria at this time? Do we not apply the understanding of the apostate Protestants as being Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Have, has not the church accepted the understandings of the apostates rather than taking the instructions given by Father Miller? Have they not set aside line upon line? Have they not set aside Miller's rules and believe that their own interpretation, just like this with the rest of the world, is superior to this? <clears throat> when we look upon this, therefore I will make the apostates as an heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard. And God will discover the foundations thereof. If our foundation is not upon the rock, then whereupon are we building? Are we not building upon sand? And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man and his heritage. Therefore, Thus saith the Lord, behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. In that day shall one take up a parable against you, 
and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, we be utterly spoiled. He hath charged the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walk uprightly? Do we walk in the assurance of faith? Where is our faith? Is our faith in the word of God or is our faith in, to be placed in the word of man? Someone could read these, these last two verses from Micah, verses 12 and 13. Please. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. What symbolically is being referenced here? What is being shown? Are not, the um, are, are these yeah, not, go ahead, please. I was going to say the loud cry, and also I can see Christ coming, leading his people. Exactly. Those that would have faith in Christ. Not in the word of man. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, how soon the scenes of desolation, of destruction and desolation will come. And be universal, we cannot tell. Be ye also ready, saith the Lord. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 44. Are we not to be ready for his coming at any time? Can we not see? Scenes around us indicating the soon end of things of this world. In Habakkuk, we read here she quotes verses from chapter two, verses one and two. It will not tarry beyond the time appointed. Habakkuk 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Then we are told to read <clears throat> verses 3 through 20. Habakkuk 2, 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Yet, what vision are we referring to? To what? Yeah, this would be the Chazon vision. Exactly. The great vision. The panoramic vision. 
So when we look at this in the way that those translators had for the King James, we find their references come primarily from the book of Daniel. We have Daniel 10, 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days for the vision, for the halzon, is for many days. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Is this not the speaking of the king of the north and the king of the south, the negotiation, <clears throat> the lies at one table? And then we have Daniel 11.35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. This time appointed. Is yet coming. We are seeing the evidence of it all the way around us. Yeah. Well, this word time appointed is the Hebrew word moed. Okay. Which refers to uh, the feasts. So this is referring to the prophetic periods that end uh, in 1798, not to, to 1844, that period of time. So that time of the end being referred to as 1798, and the Moed would be the Day of Atonement in 1844. So that would be its, its application. So we're talking about the 10th day of the seventh month. Yeah. So we have in this, in this time appointed, we have a waymark the 10th day of the seventh month, that is very important for us to understand and for us to apply. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. What a promise. What an observation. Yea, also because he transgress transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied but garnereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. Who is it that transgresseth by wine? And what symbol are we seeing here? Well, wine can be uh, false doctrine, you know. Correct. But what symbol do we further see here that uses false doctrine, is proud, enlarges his desire as hell, and gathers unto him all nations? <laughs> drunkards of Ephraim. Let's see that. We have the drunkards oh, I see of the <clears throat> The, the papacy in general, but, but anybody who wants to be extremely greedy and imperious and collect the whole world as his followers and worshipers, like, like globalists. Like the globalists, like those that prefer the new world order. How 
Habakkuk is giving us a warning for this time and for this day. And this warning is being tied in and along with the book of Daniel, along with the book of Zephaniah. Shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, woe to him that increaseth that which is how long and to him that ladeth him with thick clay shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them because thou hast spoiled many nations all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land <clears throat> of the city and of all that dwell therein. Woe to him that covereth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Can someone else read the next four verses, please? Verses 10 to 13. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people, and have sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for ver very vanity? What do we see here? What happens if a stone is crying out of the wall? And what happens if the beam out of the timber shall answer it? What symbols are we seeing here? I'm thinking now, of the rocks, rocks crying out. Right. Well, it looks like the buildings themselves are uh, oppressed. That is... Um, this crying out has to do with um, just kind of persecution that, that occurs. The stones, in many ways, are a representation of the foundations. If our foundation is that of Christ, and others are choosing to look to oppress those that have a pure faith, are they not attempting to oppress Christ? Are they not attempting to do battle against him? For the earth shall be lifted up with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. What kind of a reference are we seeing here? Can we not apply this? to what was happening in Noah's day after the flood when he had become a man that tended the vineyards and had the fruit of the grape but was not covered by his son
Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and all that dwelleth therein. What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake to the dumb stone, arise. It shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver. There is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. We see today many that view themselves as highly intelligent but that set aside the word of God. Making themselves idols. Seeing They're, themselves as an idol. Exactly. Are we also not seeing those that are making the earth an idol? Yeah. Right now, so many things that are being done are no different than the idolatrous worship that we find described within the scripture. The sacrifice of the unborn and the newly born. The worship of the creation rather than the creator. The decisions to set aside the words of God and to lift up the words of man are no different today than they were in the time of the judges, in the time of Moses, in the time of Noah. Now we are to compare this. Habakkuk. We see this Habakkuk 2.20. 2.20, of course, is a symbol of reunion and restoration. Is this not our desire? To recognize that the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Are we not to worship him in spirit and in truth? Now we compare this from Habakkuk with Zephaniah 1.7 and Zechariah 2.13. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath prepared his guests. And Zechariah, be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. As this letter continues, Mrs. White gives a specific piece of warning. In Zephaniah, we read, and here we are told that she quotes the entire book, all of the chapters of Zephaniah. In connection with these scriptures, read the first four chapters of the prophecy of Zechariah and the entire book of Malachi. Brothers and sisters, please note. 
that Mrs. White gave instruction in this letter to read the entire book of Zephaniah. And one line later, it should be read along with the entire book of Malachi. Prior to this, she gave instruction that the entire book of Malachi should be read along with the 58th chapter of Isaiah. These represent the only times that in the currently published writings of Mrs. White, that she gave an admonition to read an entire book. Okay. Now, now you just, in your note, you say the book of Zephaniah, but she says the book of Zechariah. You just. The first four chapters of the prophecy of Zechariah. Okay. And then, and then she talks about the entire book of Zephaniah. She said here. Oh, there. Okay. 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 So she got the entire book. Yeah. Right. I do not want to get the two confused. Yeah. Okay. Now, the book of Zechariah is a bit different from Zephaniah. In Zechariah, in Zephaniah, we are seeing our great need of repentance as we have been going through Zephaniah chapter one. In Zechariah, in the first four chapters, I believe we see the need of the priest that is standing in the holy place to have a change of raiment. As we have covered in the book of Malachi, this is a letter to those that would be of the 144,000. I found it interesting that only Zephaniah and Malachi are being presented that we should be considering the entirety of what they had written in line with what she is presenting here. Why only these two prophets? Why was Malachi in manuscript 106 of 1893 being presented that it needed to be read along with the 58th chapter of Isaiah? We need to consider this carefully. We need to take our time personally to look over this admonition that she has presented. These scenes will soon be witnessed just as they are clearly described. I present these wonderful statements from the scriptures for the consideration of every one. The prophecies recorded in the Old Testament and the word of the Lord for the last days and will be fulfilled as surely as we have seen the destruction of San Francisco. Does this also not mean that we will surely see the destruction that is to come upon Nashville? Now, just uh, one comment regarding uh, the visions of, that Ellen White had regarding Nashville. Sure. Um, the first one was July 1st, 1904. And the second one was August 24th, 1906. So there were no visions in 1905? Um, I haven't found them, but... I have 1904 and 1906 so far, okay. um, and that's uh, uh, from manuscript 152, 1904, which is published or, or written on July 5th, 1904. That's the first time she mentions it, and then we have uh, 
two years later, um, Friday, August 24th, 1906. Okay. <clears throat> so both of them are on Friday nights, um, I think, or the ones early morning hours of Friday. So the first one's Friday night and the other one's the early morning hours of Friday. Okay, so we have a, what about manuscript 188, 1905? Okay, so that one I hadn't found. Okay. Now, this is one that was, again, stated as being previously unpublished. January 21st, 1905. And this was a sermon that was given at Mountain View, California. Okay, so that one... Yeah, so January 21st, 1905? Yes. Okay. So in this, in this, the, in paragraphs 13, 14, and 15, I will read those carefully. When I was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people. And in the night session or night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying unto God for mercy. You knew it, said they. You knew that this was coming and never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think that they had never told them or given them any warning at all. The next scene, was pre next scene presented was a messenger in a house who took a map and showed them on that map where were cities, where were villages, where there were places that should be visited. And there were only a few places dotted here and there where they had visited. How can those that go, how, here are those that can go forth and will they go forth? He pointed to these places, to the cities and the villages and the different places that have not been worked. Scarcely nothing done in them. Here were men and women that knew the truth. They may not be ministers. They may not be ordained, but they know the principles of truth and understand the word of God. And here this messenger of God pointed out the places and the work which must be done in the south. Here was the work right around them in the south. Yeah, so that that must refer to the vision she had on July 1st in 1904. Okay. She was giving words of warning for an extended time that had to do with Nashville. She was being given the Nashville vision before the destruction that fell upon San Francisco. Will any body of men bring upon themselves the displeasure of the Lord by framing a law for the observance of a spurious Sabbath and then completing or compelling obedience to this law? Will they insult God by profaning his holy day and assuming authority as gods to exalt the first day of the week to be observed by all? I find it interesting. I had conversation this week with one with whom I have studied in the past. He and his wife recently made the choice to leave Northern Idaho to move to Kentucky. 
his wife wanted to purchase a farm. They purchased a farm from the Amish. There's a lot that they're having to do to make this place more habitable. But one of the things that's come up for them that has been intriguing has been how well accepted that they have been in and among the people in that area of Kentucky, but especially with the Amish. There is a group that they have been talking with, a group of Amish that are more closely studying their Bibles. It's interesting because they've had the opportunity to address with them the spurious Sabbath and the true. Right now, right now we have an opportunity as we are studying the words of the prophets to come to an understanding of the messages that we will be required to give. How can men set aside the true Sabbath when they know that God came to our world and from Sinai's mount in awful grandeur proclaimed his law to be observed in commemoration of the day he had ordained as a day of rest, a day ever to be kept as a memorial of God, as the creator of the heavens and of the earth? He made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, and was refreshed. He sanctified the seventh day, because that in it he had rested. He instituted the Sabbath as a memorial, pointing to the fact that he was the creator of the world, the monarch of the universe. The God has given to men the day that he has chosen to be observed by all the world and regarded as a sacred rest day. In the 20th of Exodus, we find the commandments that God has given as ruler of the world. All who set one of these aside and present in its place the observance of a day that bears no sanctity will be dealt with by Jehovah as usurping an authority that infringes upon his divine prerogatives. The Sunday Sabbath, a child of the papacy, is set forth to be observed as the Lord's Sabbath. And to obey this human law would compel men to transgress the laws of Jehovah. Human enactments that conflict with the laws of God, bear not the stamp of divine approval. We are presented, brothers and sisters, with many human enactments that are in conflict with the laws of God. The 10 precepts that were given upon Sinai have just as much import for us today as they did for the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. If we set aside one of these laws, we are trampling on all of the other nine. We should remember with what awe-inspiring authority God has set apart the sacred Sabbath as a memorial by which men shall acknowledge that he is God. And beside him there is none else. In the closing verses of the 31st of Exodus, God speaks, for we read. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 
Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Why is it important that we be sanctified? Well, sanctified means to be set apart for God's service in our case. Like we're supposed to be consecrated wholly to him and separate from the world and sin. We are presented with three steps through the sanctuary. Justification, sanctification, judgment. And then when we are judged and we are found guiltless, we can then be glorified. If we are not willing to be sanctified, then we stand in our own robes, in our own characters, which are but filthy rags before the creator of the universe. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Is this spiritual death? Is it symbolic death? It is literal death. It is eternal separation from Christ, his Father, and the Spirit of God. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord, whosoever <clears throat> doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. <clears throat> is this not a repeat and enlarge of exactly what was being presented within the 20th chapter of Exodus. What do you see here? Is God speaking symbolically? Is this being spoken in a symbolic manner? Yes or no? The Sabbath is a literal day, each day of the week. Agreed. But is this being presented symbolically? Yeah. I would, I would have to say that this is being presented very directly. That he is, he's being very specific about Yeah, no, there's a number of things about that that passage because it talks about verily my Sabbath she shall keep. Now we know uh, this this verse here, Exodus thirty one thirteen, is also quoted in uh, Ezekiel chapter twenty verse twelve. Okay, right. So um, now there in Ezekiel chapter twenty. He's talking about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. That's going to be his vision that happens on the 10th day of the fifth month. Right? Agreed. So that's going to be his uh, third vision. 
and so he's going to quote it basically um, word, word for word as far as um, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So it's just in a different uh, uh, person, right? So this is in the third person rather than in uh, the second person. And then um, in verse 20, it's also uh, not quoted directly, but it's, it's paraphrased. And hallow my Sabbath, that ye, that, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. So, so it's knowing that I am the Lord your God, and also I am the Lord that, the Lord that doth sanctify you. So sanctification is, is knowing God. So people often talk about knowing God, but you can't know God without having his character. You have to be sanctified to know God. You can't just get to know God casually. You have to take up your cross daily and follow him. You have to yoke up with Christ, bear the same burdens that he bore in order to understand and know him. So there is a symbolic aspect to it, but literally this is about the seventh-day Sabbath. But in Ezekiel, it is being used more symbolically. I would agree. I'm looking at this with the presentation here in Exodus. Mm -hmm. At the time of this portion of the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because God is having to explain to a people that for many years had not honored the Sabbath. They had lived as slaves. Mm -hmm. They had lived under another's rule. Now, we are living in a time where the worship, where the setting aside of the Sabbath has been lightly regarded. And it has sadly been lightly regarded by many within the corporate church. We cannot afford to do this in any manner. Again, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. That's definitely not symbolic. No, it is not. You're greed. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. These are warnings. These are admonitions from God through Moses to his people. Here is Mrs. White quoting Moses, quoting God. Nothing is more direct. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. How can we enter into a covenant relationship if we do not understand the terms of the covenant? This has been a question that we've asked multiple times in our meetings here on Sabbath. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. 
these, I believe, are the two tables that will one day be revealed within the ark. Whoever of the human family will dare to defy the Lord God will pay the penalty by meeting the great lawgiver over his broken law. These words of the prophet are most solemn. The word has gone forth. It is not the word of a human power, but of almighty authority of a living and true God. Will man dare trifle with the sacred law of Jehovah and place in its stead a common workday that marks the beginning of the week for the transaction of ordinary business? Who will venture to meet Jehovah over his broken law? Brothers and sisters, we have many currently within the church that have less regard for the Sabbath than did the pharaohs of Egypt. I'd be surprised how many people go out to eat on, on the Sabbath. I do not... <laughs> I, I'm not going to disagree with you, brother. Not at all. When I came back into the Adventist church after September 11, 2001, I was shocked to see the number of members of churches calling themselves Adventist that were more than willing to go out to eat on the Sabbath. That were more than willing to go to theaters on the Sabbath. Oh, but it's, it's a God movie. It's something that is, that, that, that is presenting the word of God. We can do this. How much further is the transgression of his law to be allowed. Are we not to stand as a peculiar people, one different from the world, giving a warning message, a final message to all of the inhabitants of this world? The creator has with his own authority given you his Sabbath to observe. And yet human agencies will attempt to set aside the seventh day Sabbath, which commemorates God's holy work of creating the world in six working days and resting on the seventh day. How can men dare assume the authority of Jehovah and represent themselves as God to change times and laws. Over the years of my life, I have made friends in many different places. One friend that I had made was a man that was very proud of his heritage. He was very proud of his, of his Jewish heritage. We had many conversations. It was interesting to me that, that his wife was not Jewish. She was shocked to understand that I had been raised Lutheran as she had been. But my friend and I had a, a conversation one day in his house on a Sabbath. He wanted to fix something to eat. He looked at me. <clears throat> he said, what do you think of this? I took a look at what he was offering and I said, no, thank you. This is not something that, that I would prefer to eat. 
And he asked me why. And I said, well, <clears throat> as I have read what you call the Torah, there are things here that we should not eat. We had spoken many times about the Sabbath. He looked at me and he goes, man, you're more Jewish than I am. On that, I shook my head. There are many within the church that should understand ever more fully what it truly means to honor the law of God. We have had more light than any other generation. We have had the light of the Old Testament, of the New Testament, and of the spirit of prophecy. And yet, many times we find this light is shunned. Is it fun to give a message like this? No. Is it necessary? Yes. I call the attention of thinking men to these things. Dare you continue to take a human enactment that bears not the stamp of divine approval and place it before the people as something to respect and honor? Will you substitute a counterfeit in place of the true and the genuine? Will you thus meet God over his broken law and stand with threats of persecution and severe punishment against the people whom you regard as criminals because they choose to obey the law of Jehovah in place of a spurious Sabbath that man has created? It is important for us to understand how seriously God views the transgression of the Sabbath. For does not God view this transgression just as seriously as he does the murder of babies, the unborn, and those that are defenseless. We have to consider that God is jealously regarding the day of rest that he has given to all humanity. And that this is not something to be trifled with. The patient tenderness with which God instructed the Israelites and prepared them for receiving his law is revealed in the 19th of Exodus. You have seen, he declared, what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings, the people unto the Lord. And this is the end of Exodus 19.9. God desired to be near his people in order that they may realize the terrible majesty of his power and the sacredness of his law. So in mercy, he drew near and caused a thick cloud to separate him from their sight that they might not be destroyed by the presence of his glory. Through the thick cloud, they could hear his voice. Though I look through a glass darkly, as Paul wrote, today <clears throat> we look upon many points We are separated from God, but we can be reunited with him. It is a choice for us to make today. The habitations of men 
were not chosen as the place where God would speak his law. He chose not the magnificent palaces of the wealthy, but led his people to the foot of Mount Sinai so that they might be surrounded by his created works while he appeared at the top of the mount, far removed from all that man had built in pride and self-glorification, the Israelites were made to realize man's utter insignificance in the presence of the Almighty. There's a story that one night Theodore Roosevelt was having a conversation with a friend. And the friend was commenting upon how many wonderful things had recently been accomplished. President Roosevelt and this man walked outside. And as they walked, President Roosevelt suggested to the man that they observe what was above them. As they looked at the canopy of the stars, as they looked at the creation of the Almighty, President Roosevelt looked to his friend and said, now that we have seen our place, our significance in this universe, I think we can more properly understand that which is yet before us. We are not significant. We are not doing for God. We are to walk with God and let him lead us. We are not leading. We have to choose what banner we are going to march under. Are we marching under the black banner of the great apostate? Or are we marching under the blood-soaked banner of Prince Emmanuel? Exodus 19.17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. What other furnace? can we call to mind at this time? Well, I'm thinking of Isaiah 48, 10, I believe it is, where he says that he's chosen his people in the furnace of affliction. What other great furnace of affliction do we see given within scripture? Well, when they were enslaved, of course. Was not Daniel's three friends cast into a furnace? Were they not afflicted because they would not bow down to an idol? Amen. And they were delivered. And they were delivered is exactly that. We are brought before this symbolic Mount Sinai. 
the smoke has ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount is shaking greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze. And many of them perish. And let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Again, priests sanctify themselves. How can we come before God if we are not willing to be sanctified? And Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. Then the Ten Commandments were spoken. It would be well to keep these commandments in printed form, in plain sight, in every house. We have an admonition here that we are to keep these commandments in printed form in every house. Now, Mrs. White has been very clear as we have been going through this. We are to consider the prophecy of Malachi in connection with Daniel, with Zephaniah, with Haggai, and with Zechariah. Let the teaching of these books be carefully investigated. Also the building of the temple and the temple service. Through the prophets, God has given a delineation of what will come to pass in the last days of earth's history. And the Jewish economy is full of instruction for us. Southern Watchmen, October 9th, 1906. We have gone through the prophecy of Malachi. We are now in the middle portion to go through Zephaniah. It's been interesting to me to see all of the admonitions that Mrs. White ties with just Zephaniah 1. The more we look upon this and the more we examine these prophecies with the book of Daniel, and we cannot examine Daniel without also examining Revelation. For they are the same book. Brothers and sisters. God is giving us the opportunity. To bring these scriptures together to examine these scriptures minutely in 
the mental capacity we have currently so that we may more clearly understand what God would have us to understand for this time. Any thoughts, any comments with what we have covered today? So it was Zechariah and Malachi with Isaiah chapter 58. Is that what Sister White uh, had mentioned? Let's go back to it. Yeah. So about reading it, Zechariah and with Malachi. And then... Okay. The instruction that she gave in manuscript 106 of 1893 was that the entire book of Malachi should be read along with the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Okay. But she is also stated that we should read the first four chapters of the prophecy of Zechariah and the entire book of Malachi. Okay. So our combination would then be the entirety of Zephaniah, the first four chapters of Zechariah, the entire book of Malachi, and the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. So, this is a good bit of reading. But we can go over these chapters of Zechariah and the 58th chapter of Isaiah fairly easily on a Sabbath day. Yeah. I mean, if, if we looked at this right now, I'm going to open the 58th chapter of Isaiah. We have 14 verses. Isaiah 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Just this one verse. Who is being addressed here? To whom is this message to be given? Figuratively, in a symbolic method, to whom should this message go? It's addressed to my people, but that includes those who think themselves his people. Right. House of Israel. Can we not also compare this with the ninth chapter of Ezekiel? Do we not have men clothed in linen? In the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Where are they to start with their message? Judgment begins at the house of God. 1 Peter 4.17 And where do we find the house of God? In the ninth of Ezekiel. Do we not find the house of God in Jerusalem? So should we start writing the GC then? (laughs) Because I've considered it. Not that it would do any good, but. Mm 
we are given a message. <clears throat> Those that give this message in the ninth chapter of Ezekiel are to begin at the house of God and what is in their hands. Do they not have a slaughtering weapon in their hands? Yes, they do. As we have addressed this slaughtering weapon, to me is more a symbol of the scripture, the entire scripture the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the spirit of prophecy. We're not talking about a sword, something of man's creation. We are talking about the word, the sword of the Lord, that is of his creation. There is much we have yet to to accomplish, there's much we have yet to understand. Before our next meeting, this next Sabbath, take a look at the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Take a look at the first four chapters of Zechariah. Let us then return and consider what we see as we continue in the first chapter of Zephaniah. I believe that each of these contains admonition for us at this time to understand before we are able to truly give a message before the house of God. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, I was puzzled about uh, the beginning chapter of Micah there because it said something about cast neither cast slots, cast slots in the in in the congregation. I don't have it in front of me, but so then I thought of the lines, you know. But I also thought, okay, if they were being robbed of their, or they had done, mixed up something about their inheritance by law, like I was trying to figure out what it meant, meant according to the portioning of what the tribes got and also prof, prophetic lines. So I thought there might be some connection there. I don't know. Like I have to read the background of all that was going on at that time. Okay. All right. So that would have to be read again. Any other comment? Any other thoughts? As, as this study has been going forward, I will be happy to send out what's here. This is still my rough copy because there is still quite a bit that as I have looked at these that have had to be inserted, such as this from Micah and from the other verses that we read today. The items that we see here that are in green are the notes that were entered likely by those of, of the white estate. I find it easier to be able to read and understand when I'm having the verses in front of me. 
So I'll send my rough copies out. I'll send them up to Theodore so that these can go out to everyone. And then when the finished copy is ready, then it'll be close to almost 60, maybe 70 pages. Any other comment? Shall we close with prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to learn more of you, to learn of the message and of the seriousness of the times in which we live. We thank you, Father, for the Sabbath, for this day of rest, for the opportunity that we have to draw closer to you. Be with us now. Help us so that we may clearly more understand that which is before us. So that we may walk in the path that you would have us to walk. That we may willingly do this. So that our characters may become more like yours. Direct us now. Be with us each one. I thank you for those that have attended this meeting and that those that will watch this later on video. May each encounter a Sabbath of blessings. For this, we thank you and we praise you. Now and always in Jesus' name, amen.